Thank you very much indeed for uh, having me and indeed for having a range of uh, artists uh, or uh, in my case wannabe artists involved in the uh, your conference. Um, now I don't remember, my memory is failing so I don't actually remember having said just that uh, but I'm sure, I'm sure I mean, it's, it's, actually it sounds better than anything I ever have said so I'm delighted to take credit for it. Uh, now the title of my uh, uh, presentation I think is probably the best word for it this morning as you can see is uh, Hoth Castle and Environs and when I gave that title to uh, Ken I'm sure I understood exactly what it might uh, what it might mean and how it might resonate and now I've completely forgotten no I haven't <laughs> Hoth Castle and Environs is a term that uh, has particular resonance needless to say in Ireland Hoth is a uh, town, a village on Hoth Head, just outside Dublin. Or as the uh, name occurs in James Joyce's Finnegan's Wake, that's not to be confused with anyone else's Finnegan's Wake, um, it's Ho 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 Hoth Head, my Ho Hoth Head Heavy. And uh, one of uh, Joyce's uh, one of his many objectives in writing Finnegan's Wake was to represent Ireland as a unified being, the country itself, its uh, system of rivers, predominantly of course the River Liffey, which he, he um, d d calls, he humanizes and calls in the novel Anna Livia Pluribel. Um, his, his objective here was to, as I say, present Ireland as a living body. Um, the term Hoth Castle and Environs, as Joyce scholars among you will know, is one that resonates in all sorts of ways through the novel. These, per these particular um, initial letters, H-C-E, become a kind of um, mantra through the novel so that for example one of the names of the main characters uh, <clears throat> the main character in the novel is here comes everybody HCE haveth childers everywhere so it occurred to me that this might be a way into particularly since the word environs is so to the fore thank you uh, so to the fore there, a way into presenting some, um, some ideas about uh, the significance of the environment uh, and the extent to which it might, even in my own uh, small body of work, be represented or the extent to which it might indeed be a subject for the modern uh, writer, the modern uh, playwright, the modern musical writer, the modern painter as a, or visual artist as you saw yesterday. Let me stop <coughs> blathering on and read something uh, from the, uh, well, the canon. The first great environmentalist, I think, in many ways uh, was uh, Ovid. And Ovid was a writer, as you know, who was interested in how things work in how everything came together. So what I'm going to do is begin, if I may, with a translation of a section of his Metamorphoses. And uh, it's, as you may recall from book six, lines 313 to 81. I know it's kind of early in the morning for this, but that's, that's where it comes from. Ovid, Ovid Metamorphoses. All the more reason then that men and women should go in fear of Leto, their vengeful, vindictive Newman, and worship the mother of Apollo and Artemis all the more zealously. 
This last tale of the demise of Niobe brought others to mind, inspiring no less zeal among the storytellers. On the fertile soil of Lycia, one began, the peasants too would scorn Leto and pay the price. Since these Lycians were low-born, the remarkable story of what happened is scarcely known. Though I saw with my own eyes the pond where the wonder took place. My father, being too frail to travel far himself, had sent me on the trail of a string of prime bullocks he turned out in those distant parts. He'd given me a Lycian scout, whom I followed over the rich pasture till we came to a lake in the midst of which stood a distant altar, its stones blackened by many sacrificial fires set in a quicken of reeds. The scout stopped in his tracks and said in a quiet voice, have mercy on us. And I echoed him, have mercy. When I asked my guide if this was a shrine to the Naiads or Faunus or some such god, he replied, not at all, son. No common hill god or genius presides over this place, but the one whom Juno sentenced to wander round and around, never to set foot on solid ground. The goddess who dwells here was the one to whom even Delos gave short shrift, though Delos itself was totally adrift on that unstable island, breast between a palm and a gnarled olive. She brought her twins into the world, then clasping them to her breast, set off again with Juno in hot pursuit. By the time she touched down in the sea, the bellywick of the chimera, or chimera, she was completely whacked from her long travail. The intense heat had left her drained, her breast milk had run out. Just then she stumbled upon a fair to middling sized pond in which some locals were cutting osiers and bent, bent grass that's to say, and sawgrass and sedge. Leto knelt by the water's edge and made to cup her hands. But these local yokels shook their reaping hooks and sickles and wouldn't let her drink. Why, she begged them, why would you deny me what's not yours to deny? Since water, along with air and light, is held by all in common as a common right. It's not as if I'm about to throw myself headlong into your pool. My throat so dry and my tongue so swollen, I can barely utter this simple request for a life-giving drink of water. If not for mine, then for my children's sakes, I implore you to let us slake our thirsts. At that moment, the twins stretched out their little hands. Who could fail to be touched by such entreaties? These begrudgers, though, were moved only to renew their threats and foul oaths. Then, to add insult to injury, they began to stomp about and stir up the silt on the bottom of the pond, muddying the water out of no motive other than sheer spite. That was it. That was as much as the Titan's daughter could take. Since you've shown, she cried, no soft spot for me, in this soft spot you'll always stay. And stay they have. Now they love nothing more than to play in water, giving themselves over to total immersion or contentedly skimming the surface. They dawdle on the bank only to dive back in. 
Now, as ever, they work themselves into a lather over some imagined slight. Since they continually curse and swear, their voices are hoarse, while their necks, insofar as there's anything between their heads and shoulders, are goitered, with their yellow paunches set off by backs of olive green, they go leaping about the bog hole with their frog fellows. So she changed them into, turned them into frogs. I'll read a little poem, if I may, uh, about a frog in Ireland. The frog, of course, being, as you know better than I do, one of the indicators of how healthy or otherwise our environment might be. Just one of the indicators. Despite the fact that Ireland's a very damp spot, a soft spot, as I was suggesting there, <clears throat> the frog is actually a recent enough arrival. Um, there was, in the 17th century, um, a commission set up by a couple of scientists, biologists, at Trinity College Dublin, which was then the only university in Ireland, and some, of course, would say it's still the only university in Ireland, um, where they were conducting a survey of the quadrupeds of Ireland. And uh, uh, the frog uh, would have fallen under that category. Uh, it seems. And it turns out that they searched high and low. They could not find a frog in the entire country. So next time they were over in England, uh, and they tended to move quite a lot between the two countries, they picked up a couple of frogs and set them down, as is recounted in the poem, in a uh, pond in the grounds of Trinity College and the frog went from leap, uh, by leaps and bounds, as it were. After that, taking over the country, more or less, the frog comes to mind as another small upheaval amongst the rubble. His eye matches exactly the bubble in my spirit level. I set aside hammer and chisel and take him on the trowel. The entire population of Ireland springs from a pair left to stand overnight in a pond in the gardens of Trinity College. Two bottles of wine left there to chill after the act of union. There is, surely, in this story, a moral, a moral for our times. What if I put him to my head and squeezed it out of him? I know it's a bit early in the morning, and squeezed it out of him, like the juice of freshly squeezed limes or a lemon sorbet. So that refers to a practice uh, in which, uh, who knows, Lars, Lars even at this moment may be engaging in some, uh, in some parts of Africa, perhaps the more, more desert zones than savannah. Uh, the, um, the locals, when it gets very, very uh, dry, uh, dig down, as I'm sure some of you know, and uh, dig up uh, frogs that have been buried way underground and uh, refresh themselves by squeezing a little moisture out of, out of the frog. The frog, an indicator in many ways. You know, I think I should read something set in Africa just in... Uh, give a little sh um, call out to, uh, shout out to uh, Lars. I think he mentioned uh, the giraffe there. Let me see if I can quite find my way around this. 
So, this is just a little snapshot, a little imagistic snapshot of a giraffe. A giraffe. A lorgnette, as you'll recall, is, are the, that's the opera glasses, the lorgnette. That one has a little, a little stock, a lorgnette. Though her lorgnette and evening gloves suggest she's made for the role of an opera buff, singing along with the score, her mouth's out of sync with her own overdub. I don't know if you've ever watched the giraffe eating. It's worth it. A giraffe that flubbed her lines, coming back to drink just a little more of the bubbly stuff from the dried out mud hole in which a reflection of her upper bodies already set. So her, her uh, patterned skin, like the cracked, the cracked uh, mud hole. How are you all doing? You okay? You know what? I think it's time for a little, little song. I know that you were talking. There was a oil, oil and water were on the agenda yesterday. A little, little bit of uh, the oil business. You know, we have an opportunity, or you have an opportunity later to uh, hear some songs from a band called Wayside Shrines. So I'm going to read this as by way of a little taster for that. Uh, it's a lyric called Azerbaijan, Azerbaijan, um, a country in which oil is to the fore and uh, a country which I think now attracts workers from all over the world, Azerbaijan. It might take years to win your heart, to grab a beer, would be a start. But our drinking late in TB's bar put our first date in Kandahar. Though it was right by an Air Force base, I would take flight only in your embrace. Though it was right by an Air Force base, night after night we'd close the place. I worked for years in oil and gas. Our engineers once flew first class, but the factories run out of steam. They don't need me on the sales team. The water's still on the mill race. I take the pills only to slow my pace. The water's still on the mill race. As for the mill, they'll close the place when the right buyer comes along. They say it's going for a song. Uh, you know, I resist saying too much about uh, the art of songwriting in the presence of such distinguished gentlemen as our guests from later in the, later in the morning. But as you'll notice there, <clears throat> the structure of that song is very um, traditional. It's a verse, a chorus, a verse, a chorus, and then there's always a danger at about that point that things are going to get boring. So at that point, in many cases, there's um, a little shift uh, in uh, tone and key often, the uh, middle eight, the uh, bridge of a song and some, some intellections. So that was the bridge. As for the mill, they'll close the place when the right buyer comes along they say it's going for a song. We've lived for years in the same house. Our flame burned clear, took long to douse. But we're moving on to God knows where. Azerbaijan is way up there. The house we bought through Morgan Chase it's come to naught, only this one suitcase. 
The house we bought through Morgan Chase, we never thought they'd foreclose on the place. So the refrain of the song has a slightly different um, burden, literally almost, uh, as it comes round again. Uh, So um, let me uh, read a couple of more recent uh, poems. This one's called The Mountain is Holding Out. The mountain is holding out for news from the sea of the red on the redoubt. The plain won't level with me, for news from the sea is harder and harder to find. The plain won't level with me, now it's non-aligned and harder and harder to find. The forest won't fill me in, now it too is non-aligned and its patience wearing thin. I'd no more try to guess why the lake might confess to a regard for its own sheen, no more try to guess why the river won't come clean on its regard for its own sheen, than why you and I faced off across a ditch. For the river not coming clean is only one of the issues on which you and I faced off across a ditch, and the red on the redoubt only one of the issues on which the mountain is holding out. <clears throat> How are we all doing? Any observations? How are we doing time-wise? Plenty of time. Um, Perhaps another song. You might have a chance to hear this one later on too. Uh, It's called Cleaning Up My Act. And it's uh, inspired, I suppose, largely by uh, the extent to which we seem to uh, have uh, lost any sense, in many cases, of the connection between words and, their, and, and, and what they refer to, words and their meanings. And uh, I'll read it and see how we get on with it. Cleaning up my act. There are no gentlemen in a gentleman's club. A direct flight to Reno may stop at a hub. Which seems to me to be actually one of the most extraordinary facts in our modern world, that a direct flight (coughs) may stop somewhere. Right? I flagged behind my flagon of Cote du Rhone. You'd passed out on the passion wagon when I asked you home. I told you it's a condo, it's a cold water flat. The tricks I've played are dirty tricks. That's why I'm cleaning up my act. (laughs) Nothing is a problem to a problem child. Though the issue of labeling sends me hog wild. I pick up the plot that thickens around a free-range pig. I check out a fresh chicken to find it's been deep-chilled. When did you last hear a kettle call a kettle black? I've been defiled by your sales pitch. That's why I'm cleaning up my act. 
for I was taken in by the identical twin of a pole dancer from Denver, my oh my. As for her skin, it was barely as thin as the pretext under which she asked me why there are no gentlemen in a gentleman's club. No room for nuclear families in a nuclear sub. A flight may run from renal to a renal ward. A tall cappuccino turns out to be small. Many's a mass of sugar sells itself as low fat. I'm hoping to be filthy rich. That's why I'm cleaning up my act. That one goes out to Whole Foods. Anyway, uh, let me see. A fine institution, by the way. Um, let me see. Perhaps another. Oh, I know. Let's get back to Ireland. And uh, one of the great traditions in Ireland, uh, Irish poetry, is of the nature poem. And this is a translation of a, I believe, ninth century um, poem, anonymous, as so many of these poems were. Um, anonymity, I, I'm thinking more and more. Perhaps actually not only in artistic terms, but just in terms of being a citizen. An acceptance that we are part of something larger than ourselves and our identity is connected to something bigger than ourselves. Um, anonymous, many of these poems actually written literally uh, as marginalia, um, written in the margins of texts that monks generally were copying uh, out or <clears throat> texts in which the monks were um, writing exegeses. Uh, but they broke away from the, their work, I guess, as so many artists do, um, to to write something that you know, truly fired them, inspired them. So this is a, a dialogue between King Gora, Gora, G-U-A-I-R-E, and his brother, who's a hermit. The um, tradition of uh, living as a hermit monk, very much to the fore in uh, Ireland. Any of you who uh, have been to Skellig Michael or Skellig Vichel on the southwest tip of Ireland and kind of you bit. It um, was a monastic community away from it all. Still very difficult uh, to get onto that island. One's taking one's life in one's hands. So there was a, monast uh, a monastery there at one point on the island, but one of the monks found that too much. So he took himself up to the highest point of the island and lived there in solitude, you know, getting away from it all. Anyway, um, so this is a poem that delights in uh, the things of the world, the natural world. So King Gora says this, my brother Marvin, hermit monk, why don't you sleep in a bed instead of among pine trees with only the forest floor on which to lay your tonsured head? Their heads were shaved, as you know. Your tonsured head. So this is what Marvin the uh, hermit comes back with. As it happens, I have a hut in the forest. Its precise location is known only to God, 
but I can report that on one side an ash tree stands guard, while the other is barred by a hazel such as you'd find at a ring fort. Heather stands in for its doorposts and fragrant honeysuckle binds its lintel fast. For the benefit of the pigs, beech trees let fall beech twigs and pig fattening mast. The dimensions of my hut, small but not too small, make it easy enough to defend. A woman in the guise of a blackbird spreads the word from its gable end. The great stags of Drumrollach start up from a stream that runs across a mud shelf. From there you can make out clay red, runya, macrima, and no doubt the plain of Moinmag itself. Won't you come for a tour of my wooded realm with its paths only wild beasts beat? Though I know you have much more to show, my life is quite replete. Think of the shaggy limbs of a yew tree saying its sooth. Think of a massive oak spreading a green cloak by way of a summer booth. You may ponder a huge apple tree such as you'd find at another ring fort, a tree bestowing many gifts. When it comes to nuts, the hazel trees by my hut never give short shrift. There are the best of wells and lovely waterfalls over which to gush. The medicinal yew and hackberry on which to chew are nowhere more lush. In the vicinity are goats, stags and hinds, pigs that are the next best thing to pets, and wild pigs lurking in the scrub, the badger sow and her cubs in their scent. In front of my establishment, a great host of the countryside peaceably assembles. They gather, they gather and fold. Meanwhile, the dog fox, picking its way through the wood in long socks, is lovely to behold. By the way, I just, one of the things I discovered when attempting to translate this poem was that socks actually were a feature of the monastic life. That's worth bearing in mind. Very handy to have a pair of socks actually in the middle of winter in Ireland. Um, in the face of the quickly prepared repasts on offer in my house, I couldn't be more devout. The water superb, as are the perennial herbs that accompany salmon and trout. The rowan or mountain ash, the blackthorn and the sloes within its scope, acorns in an acorn heap, a bunch of bare berry sheep dangling from bare mountain slopes, a handful of eggs, honey, more beech mast, heath peas, God sent my way. There are even more apples to prog. Prog is a technical term for stealing food, particularly apples from an orchard. Cranberries from the bog and berries known as wortle, bill or blay. Beer flavored with bog myrtle, a bed of strawberries, the only bed from which joy is evinced. Hawthorn good for a pain in the heart, you for giving it a start. Blackthorn tea for a medicinal rinse. How lovely then to quaff a cup of hazel mead from the very freshest batch, to nibble at more acorns and blackberries among the flailing thorns of the bramble patch. In next to no time, summer has come round with its dense ground cover and all it bespeaks. One of the things about this poem is that it's attempting to uh, kind of have some kind of uh, sensory assault, just the endless litany of wonderful bits and pieces that the earth has to offer. <clears throat> um, in next to no time, summer has come round with its dense ground cover and all it bespeaks, the tastes of wild marjoram, and near the pond dam, blood cleansing wild leeks. 
Bright-breasted wood pigeons will be billing and cooing in a lovely rush over my abode, the default mode of a missile thrush. Bees and beetles, their low-level hum as if through a screen. Brent geese and barnacle geese disturbing the peace just before Halloween. A lithe little linnet working its magic from the hazel branch. It's on an open door, the flock of variegated woodpeckers knock. They give themselves carte blanche. Now white seabirds come flying, herons and gulls, and the sea airs they brute. Far from down in the dumps is the grouse's thump through red heather shoots. Then the heifer lowing in high summer, daylight on the gain. Life is far from tough when we've more than enough from the bounteous plain. The call of the wind through a wood's wicker work, clouds that somehow prevail, a river that falls through rocky walls on such a pleasant scale. Beautiful too the pine trees that give me music without my making a pitch. However wealthy you may be, Christ has left me no less rich. Though you delight in having more treasures than might easily have sufficed, I'm quite content with what is lent me by that selfsame Christ. I have none of the aggravation or din of battle by which your heart strings are constantly cut, only gratitude to the Lord for the gifts he affords me in my heart. So King Gora responds to that. He says, I will give my kingdom and all that's due to me from Coleman, another saint, for the rest of my days to live, Marvin, as you. So that's the dialogue. <clears throat> you know, I might uh, just, uh, well, any observations, queries, concerns? No, I haven't, because, you know, you know what? It's a tough life. The poetry life is a tough one. Though, mind you, I think most of the artistic lives are pretty tough. Um, you know, I sometimes, uh, and I, honestly, I've been extremely lucky in my life, and I, I certainly don't mean to complain, because um, I feel quite blessed in my life. Um, and for many artists, that's... that's uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem. I mean, it's hard to know if it's more difficult to be a dancer or a um, ceramicist or an actor or a musician. I mean, they're all sort of vying for attention there in the, in the scale of difficulty. It's very hard. So, uh, as I say, I feel quite blessed. In, in having been able to combine my interest in writing poetry and, and frankly, my you know, interest in talking to students about it. But directly from it, there's really not much. Any other observations? Yes? Just uh, uh, an outright scientific observation. Yes. The list of birds that was given there is a very conceptual Yes. Well, you know, they probably hadn't much else to do except, you know, be in touch with the Godhead. Uh, but they were really... One of the observers uh, on early Irish poetry, a great German scholar, as in fact so many of them were, uh, called Kuno Mayer, um, talked about the relationship between these early Irish nature, or to the kinship rather than the relationship, um, between these, these early Irish nature poems, many of them very short, and uh, the, uh, the Japanese tradition. And, uh, he talks about how the half said thing to them is dear. The little 
hints and suggestions uh, of uh, connections between things. But as you say, connections between everything. Yes? Yes? The uh, Hobbit poem. Yes. There's an interesting feeling uh, or some uh, erotic. His father was so frail uh -huh. that he couldn't go, so he sent his son. He sent out. I think that's your heart rate, yes. Uh, uh, the, uh, my understanding of the word theoria, its etymology, uh, refers to those who were sent by city states to go and observe other places and come back and report. Oh, is that right? Uh -huh. And so there's this interesting feeling of the, uh, the poet, the artist, as going and narrating, but also theory in the sciences as such a wonderful way of thinking again about those who go in their own way, another way of knowing, and come back and narrate. So it seems like theory is the ground for this uh, humanities and environmental sciences. In a strange way, it's, it's reaching back and yet looking forward. Yes, I mean, all that uh, I really was, so much of his work, of course, seems to be about transformation. A, a, a woman turning into a tree. Um, but another way of thinking about it is that a woman or a man is a tree. It is deeply connected. That there's not an awful lot of transformation to be done, actually. Um, to, uh, to find the contact between ourselves and our fellow creatures and, and the natural world with the fellow creatures. I mean, I'm sure if Ovid were around now and realized um, how akin we are to so many animals, I mean, how closely we're connected to the pig, for example, as well as the, you guys know more about this than I do, um, the, uh, the mosquito, we're quite closely connected to the mosquito, is that right? I, I guess. That may, be, that may be not quite the case. Um, the pig, I mean, so much so that I'm actually thinking, and I've suggested this to my wife, and she's really not going for it. Um, I've suggested that I want to donate a heart valve to a pig, and uh, it seems the least we could do <laughs> in this modern era. Wouldn't that be a great thing to do? I mean, there's always a fear of rejection, but they, they have done so much for us. No? Thank you. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I was brought up with pigs. I love pigs. I feel very close to them, which is just as well, because I am, we are very close to them. Uh, you know, how are we doing to the noise? I thought, uh, oh yes, the one I was going to read, just to get back to Joyce. Perhaps a couple of uh, Joycean related poems um, that uh, refer to making connections under strange circumstances. In the first case, it's a poem called The Lance of Ochram. Those of you who are Joyce, Enthusiasts will know that that's the song on which, substantially, uh, his great story, The Dead, is based. Some kind of the setup of that song, the last of all things, it's one that's the song that, uh, um, that Greta is singing, uh, from what I recall, at the end of the, uh, the story. It's time to reread it, obviously. Um, so this is um, a poem that takes that as its title. Um, and runs with it a little bit. On a tributary of the Amazon. An Indian boy steps out of the forest and strikes up on a flute. 
Imagine my delight when we cut the outboard motor and I recognize the strains of the lass of Ochram. He hopes, Jesus explains, to charm fish from the water on what was the tibia of a priest from a long abandoned mission. So uh, this next one, uh, I began with Finnegan's Wake, Lancer, and I'll come back to uh, Finnegan's Wake, or at least a character who's very important in that novel. Uh, that's uh, the philosopher Vico. Vico, as you know, uh, had a theory which Joyce uh, took over very happy that uh, all history was circular. Everything going around, coming around. Um, it was prompted partly by the fact that there was a, not too far from Hoth Castle, um, just south of one of the southern suburbs of Dublin, was a, a road called Vico Road. So it was in his ear uh, from childhood on. So Vico. So this is a poem uh, having to do, I think I'll end with this if I may, and let you get on to the substantial part of your day. Uh, it's a poem about everything coming around. <clears throat> everything being connected. And I suppose the some version of that is what I might have been saying to Lars in you know, that conversation he was describing. And uh, a sense of that, frankly, which you know, if we don't further develop and live by, well, we're, we're going to be in even more trouble than we are right now. Um, Coleridge, somewhere in a Man in a uh, diary entry, I think it is, talks about how all narrative is akin to a snake eating its own tail. Everything comes right round. So I'm going to do a little bit of that now. So I'll come right round and then try to get off the line of bite. Vigo. A hand ringing small grey squirrel plods along a wicker treadmill that's attached by an elaborate system of levers and cogs and cranks and pulleys and gears and cams and cinches and sprags and sprockets and spindles and tablets and trundles and spirochetes and winces and jennies and jiggers and palms and pranks and the whole palaver of rods and ratchets to a wicker treadmill in which there plods a hand wringing small grey Squirrel. That's it. Thank you very much. <laughs>